bells and whistles when it comes to the most high. There ain't no show. No games when it comes to the most high. So, peace and shalom to everybody. Yeah. You might get accused of being something. I don't mean what y'all believe a lie. You know what I'm saying? You're going to walk with it. Uh, but we're going to do the best we can. We're going to teach these scriptures. We're going to pray over people. Uh, and we're going to unroll that Torah scroll. Every Shabbat. We're going to lift it high. We're going to unroll it and roll it back up and be full of uh, was it rejoicing and excitement. Because excitement. then we're going to pull it out again. Unless something happened in between. We ain't physically able to. Maybe our master return. Maybe our master ready to put things in order. Maybe the earth is in a certain position. It's tired of groaning and moaning. It's ready to have this baby. Some of y'all know what that means. You're tired. You're tired. So get this baby out of me. I don't wear, I don't wear my full turn. I'm tired. I'm ready to get this baby out. I'm ready to move on to the next chapter. Bless you. Ready to go on to the next chapter. But anyway, peace and shalom to all them. Got to get rolling. Because we ain't got long. We're going to do what we got to do. So today, applying pressure. The tools of Elohim. Thank you. I uh, couldn't think of the uh, the thing, the pressure squeezer. So you put that in Google, you get a bunch of weird stuff. So applying pressure. A move right there is called a Boston Crab. You know, if you're older, you know who that is, is the walls of Jericho, Chris Jericho. But he's putting pressure on your lower back. I know it's fake and it's entertainment, but I've done that to people. Trust me, it hurt. And get off me, quit playing, quit playing. You play too much. The Boston Crab. You're applying pressure. And the more you sit and you pull back, it hurt that lower back. Yeah. I hurt the lower back. You're applying pressure. We're going to talk about applying pressure today. Uh, but this is more about the people of the Most High. Do we apply pressure? Number one. And number two, are you using the tools of Elohim? Most High just send you out here with nothing. Now, whether or not you use it, well, that's on you. But he ain't send you out here with just nothing. He ain't send you out on the battlefield and you ain't got no weapons. That don't make no sense. What's that saying? Uh, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. You in a different kind of fight. So what, he just, he just, he, you, you just, I just jumped out the porch and just ran out there. That don't make no sense. That don't make any sense. We're going to talk about pressure today. So, Son, help me out. T tap that thing for me. All right. So, 10 strongest animal bite forces in the world. So, we, we want to get an idea of, uh, of pressure. Some of y'all, I like watching uh, it's a National Geographic, an animal channel. I like that one dude. That one dude died. You can't be playing with nature all the time. I mean, I'm dying. Now you ain't created. So we're going to look at this. I'm not going to look at all 10. I'm not going to die. I ain't going to do that to you. But I wanted you to see something. There are many ways to measure strength. And this fact stands true across the animal kingdom as well. Every animal has to eat. There are, and there are few things more terrifying than staring down the maw of a hungry predator. On this list of top 10 strongest animal bite forces in the world, we'll rank living mammals by the products, I'm sorry, by the pounds per square inch, it's called PSI, pounds per square inch, PSI, uh, that they exert when biting with some adjustments made for size. You'll be surprised to note 
that a good number are not strictly carnivores as in meat eaters, and some aren't even predators at all. So we just want to really look at the PSI of pounds per square inch. We want to look at uh, certain creatures, animals that the Most High has made and the pressure they apply. How hard? What's that got to do with us, Moray? Well, the greatest teacher of all time says, are you not more than a what? Sparrow. So if he said, hey, I take care of the sparrows. If I take care of you while you're worrying, you're better than a sparrow. So when it comes to some of these creatures that you're better than, by the way, and the force and the pressure they apply to get the job done. What's our PSI? What's our pound per square inch? What's our PSI? So we're not going to go through all these, like I said. I, that's our barometer is PSI. We'll look at the 10th. So the 10th strongest. Oh, he's fine. He's fine. He ain't no number worshiping and praise. The 10th strongest animal bite force in the world. Number 10 is the grizzly bear. That was a movie in, uh, it had to been old. It, it was probably, I don't know, I was the 80s, baby. But there was a movie about this grizzly bear going around killing people. Now that I'm older, she don't go to the woods, man. But y'all running in from grizzly bears and off in the woods. Don't go to the woods. <laughs> Even if you live there, just move. <laughs> Relocate. You don't have to be in, the, in there with a grizzly bear. So they ended up killing the bear. They had to get like some kind of elephant gun or some kind of big gun. But anyway, so we're going to look at number 10. So the first entry on our list is the grizzly bear. I'm not going to pronounce the Greek, it don't matter. With an astounding bite force of almost half a ton. This apex predator logs an impressive 975 PSI of crushing power. So the grizzly bear, when it's time to clamp down, when it's time to lock in, the pressure applied is on this scale 975 of crushing power. So it's applying pressure. Grizzly bear, number 10. Think about this, we killed that with his bare hands. My kind of man right there. I love being a <laughs> My dog right there. Despite this impressive number, the grizzly bear doesn't rely on only being strong. This omnivore is native to North America and the majority of its diet is made up of nuts, berries, fruits, and other vegetation. The grizzly bear does not use its strength to bring down prey that ranges in size from rodents all the way up to a Moose. Okay, that's number 10. The power was 975 PSI. That's a applied pressure PSI. Okay, we're just going to skip to number one. We ain't got time. Number one, strongest animal by force in the world is the saltwater crocodile. So remember, the grizzly bear PSI was what? 975. Saltwater crocodiles, Greek, not going to worry about it, are the largest of the crocodile family at 1,000 pounds and is also the living animal with the most powerful bite in the world. Saltwater crocodiles are also one of the most deadliest animals in the world and are responsible for three to 5,000 human deaths per year. A 17-foot croc with a 3,700 PSI. And that's measured in a controlled environment by top scientists. So in a controlled environment, we have a scientist. That means that the, 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 the testing barometers, it's, it's a controlled setting. But what if this creature's in the wild and they're fighting for his life? Who knows what that number is? Okay. Uh, controlled environment by top scientists. It is what it takes to bring home the gold in this category. Interestingly enough, by ex, uh, uh, extra, 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 extra mm, thank you. Extra, uh, extrapolating. extrapolating. So I got it. I'm sorry. I got it. I got it. 
this data, the same scientist was able to estimate that prehistoric crocodiles measuring 40 feet would have a bite force of 23,000 PSI. So just from looking at uh, creatures that the creator has made, uh, they apply pressure to the maximum to get whatever job needs to be accomplished, whether it's survival, whether it's eating, whether it's self-defense, being on the offensive, on the aggressive, whatever it is, these animals will do that. But you, beloved, are more important than a grizzly bear. You're more important than a saltwater crop. You're more important than number two, the gray white shark. You're more important than all of these creatures. How much pressure are we applying? How much force are we exerting? Let's turn to Philippians third chapter. How did you get there? Hallelujah. Philippians 3, we'll be in verse 14. Verse 14. Scripture says, I press, I press, I press toward the mark for the prize. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of Elohim in Mashiach, Yahshua. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ, Yahshua. So we apply pressure. If we have the capacity of 23,000 PSI, you shouldn't be rolling around operating at 230. You follow me. If you have the PSI of 5,000, you shouldn't be rolling around here at 50. Because you are more than the sparrow. You're more than a grizzly bear. You're more than a crocodile. And you're pressing towards the mark for the prize of the high calling in the most high. So let's look at the press, not me. Press is Dioko. Dioko. Almost like you're saying, never mind. Dioko. I like that. I don't like Greek, but I like that. And Dioko, to make to run or flee, put to flight, drive or drive away. Uh, Run swift, run swiftly. Okay. To pursue in a hostile manner. Not get pursued. Not running from somebody, but you pursuing after a hostility. You saying... This is my house. You saying, this is my home. You saying, this is my family. This is my child. This is my fill in the blank. And you press, you pursue after. You don't retreat. You go forward like a spear. You break the rules of aerodynamics and you... <laughs> You go through. Played baseball for a long time. Baseball was my first love. And one thing about baseball is that when you're playing to get some good pitchers, I mean, good pitchers, and might play baseball or even softball, you know what I'm about to say. If they got an arm, what's that ball do? You hear it. You up in that batter's box. 
the ball coming. And somebody got heat. And hit that glove. Pow. Pow. People that can pitch. I'm some 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 you know, Title Nine. I know it's an effect. Softball probably too. We winded it up. They probably pow. So pursue in a hostile matter. To run after, follow after, harass, uh, put to flight, drive away. There is a powerful entity in our scriptures. Uh, His name is uh, Yahuwah Zevaot, Yahweh Zevaot. Yehovah, Zevaot, Yeveh, Zevaot, uh, Yahweh, Zevaot. I think I covered all of them. Got a problem with it? I ain't going to go there because I got to move on. I got to move on. I want to say it, but I ain't going to say it. But Yah Zevaot, the Lord of hosts, he is about action. He is about advancing the kingdom. It's too easy for him just to, you know, just to get everything. It's too, it's too easy. I'm going to give you adversary mm, 6,000 chess moves ahead. You make 6,000 moves. All right, I'm not going to make a move. That's how most high is. And the pawns, it's like, I'll, I'll, if you play chess, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to capture the king. Well, you can't capture it. It's, you can't use really pawns to capture king. Pawns are just kind of, you know, fodder, just kind of there to kind of be in the way, be some casualties for war. Most I was like, I'll use the people that you deem, deem as pawns. I'll use them. I'll use them. So, Let's look at brother. Give me Ezekiel. I'm sorry, Exodus six twenty six. Other brother, give me uh, Exodus seven and four. Son, Exodus twelve seventeen. Brother Tom, give us Exodus twelve fifty one. So we got four texts coming out of Ezekiel. We're up. Exodus, 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 Exodus. Ezekiel on my mind. So do. So we got 6, 26, Exodus 7, 4, Exodus 12, 17, Exodus, and 12, 51, Exodus. Shemot, or Exodus uh-huh. 6, 26. Yeah. That's loud. And it says, these are that Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their armies. So their what? Their armies. Mm, okay. Exodus 7 and 4. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> But fail, but Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, mm-hmm. that I may lay my hand upon Egypt mm-hmm. and bring forth thine mine armies. Thine what? Mine armies, mm. and my people, the children of Israel, out of the hand of Egypt by great judgments. Mm. Shemot or Exodus 12 and 17. Mm-hmm. And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. Mm. For in this self same day uh-huh. have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Brought your what? Brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Mm-hmm. Therefore sh- shall ye observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. Mm. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, bro. Exodus twelve fifty one. Yeah. And it came to be on that same day mm-hmm. that Yahweh brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt according to their divisions. So their what? According to their divisions. Their divisions. War armies. So we have four different times in Exodus where the Torah is describing the people of God, the house of God, as what? An army. So there are some aspects about uh, God and this way that is personal, is passionate. I need healing. I need to go help somebody. But there's also some parts where you got to be military minded. There are times of the year 
with the doors open for you to pick up your tools and to apply pressure. There are times where God says there's a there's a way for you that if you're obedient to me, I'll deliver them into your what hand. How many times have we seen that throughout the text, all throughout the Tanakh, that if you do this, I'll deliver them into your hand. See, you got to be willing to go and take back what's been taken or stolen. I believe the text calls him a thief and a liar. So we were brought out as armies. Okay. They were literally brought out to what? Serve. To worship. To work. Right. Build this. Make this. Sew this. Stitch this. Do this. Sit here. Go there. Walk here. Don't move. Cross. Wait, to work. To advance the kingdom. So they were pulled out of bondage to advance the kingdom. Look, y'all move with force in Egypt. Understand, y'all move with force in your life. You were somewhere in that, just as it says in Psalms, the strong, mighty right arm of the Lord had to come and pull you out. Pull you out and remove you from wherever we used to be. That you've been taken from an Egypt, you've been taken from a Babylon, you've been taken from some form of lifestyle, some of addiction, or some form of abuse. But he took you out, and it was with force. It was hard to pull you out because sometimes we what we fought. Well, what did they do when we read it? They fought. Like, dang, Moses, you've made stuff hard for us. That doesn't sound like us. I got to do what? I got to go talk to my boss about this. I got to do this about a job about this. I got to my family about this. We're having a big family thing. I do this. So it's not easy. But that's what happens when you're in the dirt. You don't realize sometimes how dirty you are. You don't realize the stench we've acquired. If something stink and you first walk on it, it stink. But over time, you know what your nose do? You get used to it. <laughs> it adjusts to it. And you don't even know that there's a smell. Till somebody else comes and gets you and says, hey, you don't smell good. You're very dirty. <laughs> I'm fine. No, you're not. And then so the civil war begins within yourself. As someone is trying to pull you out of Egypt. So Exodus uh, 15 and 1, then, then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song to the Lord and spoke saying, I will sing to the Lord for he has highly exalted the horse in his right hand, he thrown in the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song has become my salvation. This is my Elohim. I will glorify him. My father's God, I will exalt him. The Lord, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Quick side note, we ain't going to stay on it long. I didn't know the Lord was a man. Because I know, you know, uh, our Hebrew ain't that good. But, yeah, how about, yeah, hey, why, Ish? Well, that's a Malcolm, man of war. It says man right there. Don't worry about. It. But the Most High is about action. He is a man of war. He don't mind checking darkness chin. He don't mind checking darkness chin. We mind checking darkness chin. We let darkness slide. We say, "Well, I still got some shadow in me a little bit. I, it's okay." We have to have the mentality of a warrior. 
We're supposed to be, we want to be on all these things like God and reflect like God. When it comes to stuff like this, hey, I don't put my hands on it. But we called for war. How old are you? The Israelites didn't have a choice. You a man? Yes. You 20? Yes. Grab a sword. Get a shield. Get over there with them and train and get with Joshua and them and learn how to fight. There's a passage in the scripture that talks about when kings go to, there's certain, now I'm jumping ahead. Be disciplined. Romans 7. I will, Bubba. He said, stick to the script. I will, but Romans 7, 22. So the Most High is a man of war. The Most High has came and used force to pull us or remove us from certain lifestyles and habits that we used to have. Right, hallelujah. Some of them we don't have no more, right? Hallelujah. Right. And then we still, some areas we still was. We say what? We still was. Struggle. All right. So in Romans 7 and 22, the scripture, it reads, For I delight in the Torah of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring, 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 warring against the law of my mind. And bringing me to captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Conflict. Conflict. So the Torah is designed, it is created, it is shared. We've talked about before, the sages have said that Torah is one of the seven, is it seven, that existed before creation. So... He says, I see another law in my members. Well, he's talking about his own self, or is he talking about the body of believers that surround him? But I see another law in my members warring. So we have to have the Torah. We have to have the tools that Yah has given us so we can apply pressure, so we can defend ourselves and that we can also be on the offensive for God. Romans 8. It's got to be still. If I be still, I won't do nothing. Romans 8 and 5. Just, just flip over there. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For it for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind, the carnal mind, the carnal mind is enmity, an enemy, adversary, war against who? God. For it's not subject to the Torah of God, neither indeed can be. There is no peace treaty. There is no truce with darkness and things like it. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Ephesians second chapter, first verse. Ephesians two. Being first verse. Hallelujah, you get there. Ephesians 2 and 1, and it reads, And you hath he quickened. You were quickened. Why? Because you were dead in trespasses and sins. That's war. That's God coming to claim what is his to take back that one from the flock. Some of us in here got stories, maybe not personally you, but maybe people you know. You had to go out to the crack house to pull a family member out of the spot. You understand what I'm saying? 
you was out on the block. You was out doing something. Someone had to come and get you and pull you out of there. In other words, maybe he's incarcerated. Maybe, uh, maybe you and you and Shake and you were stripping, you were dancing. Maybe uh, whatever you're doing. But there are some places that are bad. So God got to come and get you and pull you out. With that understanding, with that application, look at two and one again. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked. Your halakha was according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So you cannot have any victory if you're disobedient. God cannot hand over the enemies or hand over whatever to you because you're not what? Obedient. Three, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh. He did say all. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the what? Mind. I want to do it. I want to have it. I want to touch it. I want to feel it. The drill and rush. And were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So when you're in this state, you are an enemy to the kingdom. You are an enemy to the kingdom. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even as we were dead in sins, hath quickened, hath quickened, hath quickened, hath quickened us together with Meshach. By grace, ye are saved. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. We'll stay in Ephesians. We'll be in fifth chapter, sixth verse. Let no man deceive you with vain words. I think we had a couple of, of Sukkot's ago. Then once we hit the 5780 mark, which we're, I don't know, 5780 something now, 82. But once we hit 5780, 80 is what Hebrew letter? Pay. Pay means what? Mouth. So we hit a, so we're in a decade of a lot of what? Words, a lot of, a lot of talking. But it's talking like the soothsayer. You ever seen uh, cartoons or maybe some movies or National Geographic where they over in India and, and all those different places? And they got the state, they got the snake. The, the, the cobra's up and they, you know, and they're petting the, the vain words. The era of the Pied Piper, Peter Pan, leading you away. Vain words. So you for sure know off the Ivrim, the Hebrew that we have been blessed with, that for 10 years, you got a lot of, a lot of words. Empty words. Let no man deceive with vain words, or because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children's obedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For you were sometimes darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. There was a lot of fighting God fought to get you from one side to the other side. He fought, he came and got you. You, that's personal. But just like we read when he got them four times in the book of Shemot that he brought them out as a what? Army. Because this same tetragrammaton, Yahuwah or Yavah, Zevaot, you are a part of the host. You're a part of the host. It wasn't happenstance. It wasn't, well, you know, if I hadn't. No, 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 no. You. Look, it don't matter the avenue or the chess pieces that move to get you here. You were going to get here or somewhere like here. It don't matter. You were going to get here. Not necessarily here, but in this way. Son, Acts 24, 14. Go ahead and read, son. Give us the Okinawa 6 and, 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 and 44 and 45. 
Acts of the Apostles 24 and 14. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, uh-huh. self-worship, I, the God of my fathers, believe the what? So worship what? I, the Elohim of my fathers, mm-hmm. believing all things which were written in the law. In, in the, the what? Believing all things that were written in the law and uh-huh. in the prophets. In the who? Law and in the prophets. Joke and I. six. <laughs> Starting at verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me. Draw him. He do what? Draw him. So you were drawn. Not only were you drawn in your mama belly, not only were you drawn in your mama's inward parts, when you came from one side to the other, that was not your last transition. From darkness to what? Light. So you went from darkness to light. You came to this world, and unfortunately, I'm sorry, this world was what? Dark. So then he came and he drew you from the dark side over to the light. And he still ain't done transitioning you. Go ahead and finish that up. And I will raise him up at the last day. Yeah. It is written in the prophets. It is what? It is written in the prophets. Have mercy. And they shall be all taught of Elohim. Every man, therefore, that hath heard Mm -hmm. and hath learned Mm -hmm. of the Father, come unto me. Yeah. So you can't be taught something and you ain't even got it. It's, It's just... Emotional stuff. We're going to read uh, what's the Jeremiah? Uh, I've make you happy. And f- what's that? Uh, so Jeremiah twenty nine. Uh, the what? Right. Stuff like that. Stuff. 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 stuff I'm just saying. But stuff like that. It sound good. T shirts. <laughs> Mm-mm. Not gonna cut it. Verse eight again. For you were sometimes darkness, but now you are in the light of the in the Lord. Walk halacha as children of light. For the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Galatians. We have the infamous fruit of the spirit, correct? In verse 22, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Righteousness is not mentioned. And truth is not mentioned. So you know what that means? That there are 11 fruit of the spirit. Minister. Romans 6 and 22. Romans chapter 6, verse 22. Uh-huh. And it reads, But now being made free from sin yeah. and become servants of God, yeah. ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. You have your what? Your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Holiness is not mentioned in Galatians 6. I'm sorry, 5, 22 and 23. So you have now how many fruit of the spirit? How many different manners of fruit are mentioned in the book of Chazum or Revelation? 12. So these would be the fruits that are renewed every Chodesh, every new month throughout the what? Or because the leaves are the healing for the nations. See this, see, see, this thing is right. See, ain't nothing wrong with this thing. It's the people that's got their hands on this thing. Anyway. So, timing is everything. Timing is everything. If it was meant to happen, it will. Yes, At the right time, for the right reasons. Okay? So, we've, we've just came out of our wheat harvest. Hallelujah for being harvested. For being counted. Hallelujah. 
up a calendar here. I know we have the Babylonian names on here. Couldn't find one that had the numbers on here. So stall us out. Nissan or Aviv will be the first of months for you. One, two, three. So here we are in Sivan. Okay. On our uh, ceremonial count, our worship count. On our business count, order count, king business, business. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. So three, month three, on one count, month nine on another count. Okay. Uh, Minister, give us Hosea uh, chapter six, please. Uh, just start in verse one, Minister. Hosea, Hosea chapter 6 and 1 uh -huh. and one. come and let us return unto the Lord yeah. for he hath torn and said will heal us uh -huh. he hath smitten and he will bind us yeah. up after two days will after two days will he revive us uh -huh. and the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight on the what day? third day he shall raise us up so in regards to our worship our worship count one, two, three Three. So, after Shavuot, after being counted as wheat, we all should be what? Revived. To do what? To stand still? To let it waste? Or to apply pressure? To apply pressure. Your PSI right now should be off the charts because you've been revived. All he told you to do was count. And you counted. But as far as what falls down from heaven, he said, I will what? Revive you. I will give you what you need so you can go forth. Go forth. Go. Go. So, season of war. Make no bones about it. We're in a season of war. Scripture says, Yahshua answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. We usually talk about once we get out of uh, history, we get in the Hesh van, right? The eighth one, we all talk about it, what? Getting dark and time condensing it, the sun going down. And we really don't talk about what about when there's more? Like, what should we do? Well, if you've been revived, if you've been quickened, then you have to go and you got to apply pressure because it's a time for war. It is a time where you press or you persecute or you pursue after. First Corinthians, 10th chapter. First Corinthians 10 and verse 1. Hallelujah, when you get there. Mr. Ready. I'm a bit ready. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1, and it reads, Moreover, and brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all did eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with them, many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown overthrown, overthrown. And so do not get overthrown. If the doors are open for us to be in attack mode, don't think that your enemies are just going to let you do it. Like you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't think that they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our example. 
So when we read and we look at them in their journey coming out of Egypt, going to the mountain, after the mountain, these are examples for us. What are they doing in the first month, in the second month, in the third month? We can go back and we can read it. It'll tell you exactly what they was doing. So Shaul says, hey, these things are our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Don't be idolaters. Let's keep rolling. Oh, in Exodus 32. I agree. You're right, Mama. It is a little hot in here. No, you said it was cold in here. Well, I don't agree. I don't agree. <laughs> her glass, her glass. Can do. I ain't say that. No, no me lying on me on no Shabbat. Me lying on me no Shabbat. <laughs> so Exodus 32 and 1. And when the people saw that Moshe delayed to come down from the mount, the people gathered themselves together to Aharon and said unto him, Up, oh, make us a God. Who shall go before us? For as is Moses, the man that brought us about the land of Israel, we know not what has become of him. Remember, we left off last week. It was dark. It was thundering. It was lightning. They're seeing sounds. It's crazy. It's just, yo. And Moses just, Gone. So the people, right? Vayar haar he beshesh Moshe. They saw that Moses delayed. So we really need to look at what delayed means. What does that mean? Bush. Bush, to put to shame, be ashamed, disconcert, to be disappointed, to be ashamed, disappointed by by reason of, to be dis or, uh, to, to to be let down. You had an expectation for something and it didn't happen the way you key word is you want it to happen. And then you were ashamed. But they translate that that bush as delayed. So the people saw that Moses delayed. In other words, the people tapped out. The people lost hope, lost faith. They didn't know what to make of it. Whoosh. Implication to be ashamed, to be disappointed or delayed, to be put, to be made, to be made ashamed, right? So in the, in, 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 in the, in the uh, uh, Chaldean lexicon, to fail in hope and expectation. So whatever they were expecting to happen, whatever they thought God was going to do, since they, since God didn't do what they thought it was going to do, they said, hey, Aaron, get up and make us some gods. So because Moshe delayed it had nothing to do with Moses. It had nothing to do with the Most High. I didn't get what I thought I was supposed to get. At the time, I wanted it. And since I didn't get it, I need a replacement. And then that's where idolatry sets in. So I ain't got to be at the bottom of the mountain to be an idolater when God does not do what I want him to do when I think it should happen. See, the denominator is I. Oh, 
So we make gold. We, 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 we find ways to make golden calves to supplement what we feel like God should have did. And we justify it by saying, oh, I'm hurt. Oh, oh I didn't get it. Oh, it left me high and dry. See how the adversary keeps you from using the tools. You see that? Because someone, you're not worthy. It's a hoax. Create a big one. God don't love you. Because it's not powerful. Satan doesn't have the power. He's got the gift of gab. The serpent is the most subtle creature to all the things that most I created. So I'm going to talk to you in an area where you're not defending. I'm looking for the gap. And when I find the gap, I just slide in. Because serpents don't have a backbone. And then we're just like them. Yes. We build golden calves. This way of life requires spiritual stability. And we cannot be emotionally driven. That first encounter at the mountain was about emotions. I believe that was mentioned in class today, wasn't it? Or close to it. I didn't say a word. It can't be about emotions. You follow me? It can't be about emotions. I'm going to keep you on the stay on track. Second Corinthians, first chapter. Second Corinthians one. We're going to start in the third verse. We're going to read to the 12th verse. I right, when you get there. Second Corinthians, first chapter, three through twelve. And when you and, and when you get in your Bible and you read, I, I I love how they start off letters. They include the heavenly hosts. They be like the Most High, y'all should they conclude the hosts. So third third verse. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Master, Yahshua HaMashiach, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation. Now, there's some tribulation which we, we have to go through. It is what it is. There's some tribulation. We drove ourselves to the arena. You were not invited. You know that. Jeremy, yes, you didn't invite yourself. Why well, I got here. Someone told you. Someone put in your head. And then we drive or we go places. That shouldn't even went there. Don't let people push you over the edge. Right. Tell the truth. Right. That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. That's where the testimonies come in. This what's going on with me. Might be. Level 5.2. Going on with somebody else? 11. Broke the Ricker scale. And there's comfort in each other. That's how we become because the same God yeah. is our what? Health care provider. Yes, he huh? He's the same heart surgeon. He's the same right shrink from my mind. Yes, he is. He's the same. He's the same one. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds by Christ. So we suffer for a reason. There is a victory for you. Remember, the Lord is a man of what? War. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer. This is why if the saints throughout all time have suffered, we will be no different. It's not fair. 
folks gonna be up in the resurrection, the kingdom talking about so wait a minute, I had to go through this and this. Well at the end they did they got what? They got picked up by a UFO and dropped off somewhere else. Because what happens is when you don't earn it, it doesn't feel the same. If you've ever competed in anything, there's something about the grind. There's something about the, mm, the fight and the battle. And then that's why they say, hey, the consolation. So you ain't got to be first. Just finish the race. Just finish the race. And there's a prize. Seven. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye all be also of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. This is why we must apply pressure and use the tools of Elohim because the other team is going to press us. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in Elohim, which raises the dead. Who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Ye also helping together by prayer for us that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf for our rejoicing. Rejoicing, rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, then in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, not with fleshly. Uh, we had to read all that to get to not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word inward. See, logic and reason does not fill the gap. Logic, reason, rationality, it doesn't fill the gap. Logic and reason will not make you Tom Yin complete. It just won't. Example. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about them. And they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, kadosh, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is. If you saw that, you would say, turn off that rated off stuff. If you say, you would know. We cannot wrap our mind around the supernal holiness of God. And he says, stop doing that. Don't try to wrap your mind around me. Let my supernal holiness wrap around you. You follow me? We can't wrap our mind around that. I'd be jumping up out of my sleep, fighting, swinging. I saw a creature with eyes all around itself, floating around. So I'd jump up to swinging and fighting, just swinging and fighting. Because you can't wrap your mind, you can't wrap your mind around that. Especially in our era. I get it. They come from a time, the ancients, they did a lot of worship, and I, I got it. But not us. Not us. So we cannot wrap our brain around the supernal holiness of Elohim, but rather let the supernal holiness wrap itself around us. That Now we're entering submission. What is God wanting us to be what? Submissive. He's looking for the submissive bride. God doesn't need us to help him with us. You follow me? God doesn't need us to help him with us. Because I'm going to take every shortcut I possibly can find. Because I don't want to get on the table. Oops, I'm sorry, altar. I don't want to. So remember, uh, one of our points from our Shabbat celebration, that Messiah is the carpenter's son. Messiah is the carpenter's son. You are his workmanship. You are his project. Most importantly, you are his love. 
So he's saying, hey, let me help you. And we're halfway there. But the closer you get to him, the more of his what? Light shines. When his light shines, it shows us stuff. And sometimes we look at our own selves and say, ah! Philippians 3 and 21, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Whoa. He's going to change our vile body that it may be fashioned because he's the carpenter. You are his workmanship. You are his project. You are an amazing add on. Upgrade being fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is even able to subdue all things unto himself. So he's like, I am submissive to my father in all things. And because I was, I was exhausted <laughs> above all things. Will you come and be with me? But I'm way up here. Now I came down there one time. Next time I come down there about my father's business, I'm going to have a different look. My eyes will be blush, blood, blush, I read. Come on, father's fire. I'm going to have different garments on. I'm going to have different crowns on my head. It's going to be something on my thigh. And I can be able to understand. But before that happens, I want you to be with me. But you, us, we have to, that song say, let go and let God. Let go and let God. He's trying to work us to where we are fashioned unto his glorious body. Remember what Shaul says, that this is the mystery between Mashiach and the church or the, uh, the Chahal, the Hebrews, the Chahal, the, the congregation, the, the gathering of the people. Second Corinthians 5 and 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to Elohim. Be ye reconciled. Very important that we're reconciled. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. Uh, I'm sorry, Romans. Romans 14 and 8th verse. 14 and 8. Bless you. Romans 14 and 8. Hallelujah if you're there. And the scripture reads, For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die to the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, 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 that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? For why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. So to, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. It's a great practice for us, I believe. Right? A great practice. Another slide here. No, this is mentioned today multiple times. And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. First Corinthians seven thirty five. It's talking about weddings and marriage, it's different things like that. But the point is to attend upon the Lord or to attend to the Lord's business without what? 
distractions. Serving God, doing the work that we got to do, applying pressure without what? Distraction. Because it's somebody's job to make sure you are what? Distracted. Because someone doesn't want you applying all of your PSI. I don't know what your number is. But whatever your PSI is, someone does not want you operating at full capacity. And the best way to keep you from operating at full capacity is to have you distracted. Heard the phrase multitasking? How many of you multitask? It's impossible, ain't it? You'll multitask and you have five or six, seven things going on. You're writing your little notebook and all stuff looks good and nice. And you know what you get done those five or seven things? None of them. You don't get any of them done. You don't. You got 10 things written down. You got zero done. You're over 10. Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Hallelujah, you there. Okay. Good. Oh, so good. It was so good. Ephesians 6, 10th verse. Finally, my brethren, be strong and out of night and put... And, and in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about truth. Stop right there. You read this for years and eons, having your loins girt up in truth. So how to gird your loins? <laughs> you see, when you start out in a tunic, it might say robe, but like a tunic. And then you pull them up, roll them up a little bit. And then you pull them forward. You bring it back through the other side. And you wrap it around. And you tie it up. And now you have girded your loins. That's what it means to gird your loins so that you can do what? Fight. So in other words... We go from a worshiper to warrior. You go from a worshiper to warrior. You go from a what? But see, you can't be a, a warrior if you're not a what? Worshiper. So when we gird up our loins, we're preparing for, we went from worshiping, now we go to war. Now we're now we ready to get some of that action. So we have to go and conquer for God and you take it by force. This is exactly what he meant to gird up your loins in truth. Because the word Hebrews 4, 12 is a what sword. Yah himself says, I take my glittering sword, I raise it up with my hand. First Samuel 17. Almost done. First Samuel 17. Hallelujah. We're going to be in starting verse 32. Can I get a reading? You can read that from Deacon 32 through 39. Hallelujah. We, we, brother in 1 Samuel 17, 1 Shmuel 17, 32 through 39. All right. 
Kirk Shmuel, 17, starting at verse 32. Mm-hmm. And Dawid said to Shaul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Uh-huh. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And fight who? Philistine. Mm. And Shaul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine mm. to fight with him, mm. for thou art but a youth. And he a man of war from his youth. He's a what? A man of war from his youth. But if the Lord is a man of war uh -huh. and the Lord is with you, then victory is right there for the what? Taken. Uh -huh. Go ahead. And David said unto Shaul, thy servant kept his father's sheep. Uh -huh. And there came a lion mm. and a bear mm. and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him yeah. and smote him mm. and delivered it out of his mouth. Uh -huh. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and mm. smote him and slew him. Uh -huh. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine, this, shall, what? this uncircumcised Philistine, mm shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. The who? The armies of the living God. Remember, you were called an army when he pulled you out. Go ahead. David said, moreover, um, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion yes. and out of the paw of the bear, yes. he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. Yes. And Shaul said unto David, go, and the Lord be with thee. Mm. And Shaul armed David with his armor. With his what? With his armor. Uh. And he put an helmet of brass upon his head. Yeah. Also, he armed him with a coat of mail. Mm. And David girded his sword upon his armor, mm. and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. Mm. And David said unto, uh, unto Shaul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. All right, that's good. So, David is a youth. Goliath is a man of war. He's been fighting his whole life. David hears the blasphemies that he's saying against the Most High God. David convinced King Shaul to let me go fight. You know what King Shaul does? He starts dressing David a certain way. And he starts putting an attire on David that is not for David. He starts putting an attire on David that is not for David. You see, we have to be willing to go and find the Goliath in your way, in your life, in your section. You had willing to go and find Goliath and be girded up in truth. Worshipper, warrior. It can't be out of protocol. You can't put on a bunch of warrior stuff and helmet and all this stuff. And it said he couldn't move. You have to be who you are. What tools has God given you? You got to use your tools. I can't use her tools and she can't use her tools and so-and-so can't use it. What are your tools and are you applying your full PSI to them? Because if you are, then you can go kill Goliath. And this is the season where you go and you search out for Goliath. David was minding his business. Daddy said, take these cheesecakes and raisins down there to the battlefield. And when he heard what he heard, he was about that action. It was on sight. It was on sight. And he had to convince the king to let him fight. And the king believed because he said, the Lord is what? With thee. Now in verse 40, 
and he took his staff in his hand. He chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and he put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a script and a sling was in his hand. He drew near to the Philistine. In other words, he used his tools. Grab your tools. Grab your tools and use them to maximum capacity. Now, in 1 Samuel 16, 4 through 12, something happens before David even gets here. God had already moved. Samuel had already anointed Dawid. He had already anointed him. He'd, God had already called him. So when God pulls you out from darkness to light, he already called you. He already chose you. Do you have your tools? Where's your tool bag? Will you apply pressure? Once we've left shot, are you going to apply pressure? Are you going to gird up your loins in truth? Because there's only one reason to gird it up that way. You looking for smoke. You looking for it. The adversary has stolen. He has robbed. He has lied. He has cheated. He's embarrassed. He's finagled. He's maneuvered. He's done all this mess unto you. And God said, take the tools. Go find the giant. Find where they at. Kick their door down and use the tools that I've given you. Apply the pressure. Hallelujah. Go ahead and preach. So what happens with some, they don't want to be a worshiper. They don't want to be a shepherd. They don't want to go through protocols. They just want to jump in. I'm ready. You can't do that. Great example. I'm glad you said during class today. So got him in here. So you ain't going to be offended. Head in here. Childbirth. It's my example. An example is childbirth. There's no logical, rational explanation for the love of the mother and the newborn. There's no how do you define that? Can you Google it and say, Siri, describe the love of a mother and her newborn? You can't. You can't. And since you can't do that, that's the same dynamic of the love between the Most High and us. And the mother provides the child with what? tools. God has provided us with what? Tools. He's provided us a way so that we can gird up our loins and that while there's so much day, there's so much light, God said, be productive for my name's sake, for the kingdom's sake. Go take back what has been stolen. You ready to push play? This is an example. Some of y'all know about this, some of you don't. But we're in a part of the movie with Daniel's son. I want to learn. I want to be a warrior. See, this sounds good and all this, it sounds good. But how you, 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 you can't be here if you ain't here. Because you never got your tools to begin with. You never got your tools. So, let's see what Mr. Miyagi got to say. Turn up, son. Walk middle, sooner or later, you get the squish. 
just like green. It's people the truth, then. Here, karate, same thing. Either you karate do less or karate do no. You karate do get so just like green. Understand? Yeah, I understand. Now ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Yes. Let's make a sacred cut. I promise to teach karate back to my heart. You promise run. I say you do. No question. That you part. Still? Still? First wash all the car, then wax. wax. Oh, well, what, what, I, 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 remember, dear, no question. Yeah, but I... Wax on, right hand. Wax off, left hand. Wax on, wax off. Breathe into the nose, out the mouth. Wax on, wax off. Don't forget to breathe. Very important. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. Hey, where do these cars come from? Wax on. Detroit! Wax on. Wax on. Wax on. <laughs> wax on. Like the hand, make the circle. Max off the hand, circle. Keep stop. Walk on the this road. Pause. There you go. So, we made a covenant. We agreed to obey. All that the Most High said, we will do what we will obey. Uh, at Passover. That's why it's very important that you don't take the Passover unless you're serious. People take it and there's no follow-up. And then wonder why things go to shambles. Where's the follow-up? I want to learn karate. Okay, here's our agreement. I'm going to give you the headband. Don't ask no questions. Do what I tell you. I'm going to teach you. And he's thinking about... He's thinking about that. That's how we treat Yahshua. We're thinking like that. But you got to gird up your loins. You got to have on the right attire. You got to have your tools. And God is good at building us by breaking us down. God is good at building us by breaking us down. Even Mr. Miyagi, he understand that. And he broke Daniel down. Wash all these cars. Wax on, wax off. See, we got tools. We don't use them. There's the ability within you to have a high PSI. You ain't using it. And what's the point of having tools and having a high PSI and you're not doing anything with it? What's the point? First John, two more verses and we're done. First John, fourth chapter. First John and four and one. First John four and one. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of Elohim, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby I know you that the Spirit of God, every spirit that confessed that Yahshua Mashiach has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confessed not that Yahshua Mashiach has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. 
We have to try the spirits. When you try the spirits by the word. Part of the problem is we ain't got enough what? Word. We don't have enough word. So if you don't have enough word, you're vulnerable. And where you're vulnerable, you cannot be effective because the serpent's job is to find the kinks in your armor. To find the kinks in your armor. That's his job. Some people, sometimes, you, there's a phrase in basketball you would say to where if somebody that you know can't score, you say, let him shoot. He self-check. Just let him shoot. He ain't going to make it. Don't get that low. Don't be that low. To your PI, PSI and your tools, you don't even use them. And the other team, the other bad guys, they say, self-check. They'll mess up they sell. They're on a self-destruct path. Don't worry about them. Because when you do that, they just are able to gang up on other people. Because you're self-checked. Any guy guards you. First John, fifth chapter. Two. By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and keep his commandments, keep his commandments. It's easy to read, but hard to do. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of Elohim overcometh the world. This is you girding up your loins. This is you using your tools. This is you applying pressure. And this is the victory. You can't get, look, who was in Carruthersville? And we said to them that saints serve, saints don't sit down. Saints serve, they don't sit down. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And the faith can't be on cruise control. Overcoming victory is right there. During this season, during this stretch from now to uh, Rosh Hashanah, thank you. During this stretch, will you apply pressure? Will you use the tools that Elohim has given you? Will you say, hey, look, I can't, I, that's not me. I can't wear all that stuff. I know what God has given me and I'm a fight with the tools he's given me. I'm more effective for myself, for my family, for the assembly, for the body of Christ, for the nation of Israel. I'm more effective that way. But you got to know who you are. As we said in first, it says in first Corinthians 735 without what distraction. Without distraction. It's real simple. Kill or be killed. Go find Goliath or Goliath will find you. Go find his brothers or they will find you. Go find the Philistines or they will find. It's, it's that simple. You might play. They not playing. You might play. They not playing. So applying pressure to tools of Elohim. Um, Yah has given us so much. And sometimes we use so little. So uh, during this, we had a beautiful Shavuot. Um, I hope we keep the spiritual momentum and you use that spiritual momentum uh, to go forth and to apply pressure, um, to be aggressive for the name of God um, and using the tools that Elohim has given you because he's given you something. He didn't give you nothing. Uh, Oops, sorry. I forgot to put the via hop. Jeremiah find the via hop for us. Find the via hop. We'll say the via hop.